Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Insha'Allah we begin uh, with a verse of the Qur'an. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alam tara kayfa daraballahu mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan kashajaratin tayyibatin asluha thabit. أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس لعلهم يتذكرون. This is a verse from Surah Ibrahim, which is chapter 14, and the verse is 24 and 25 of Surah Ibrahim. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is, do you not see how Allah has set forth a parable? Don't you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has struck an example, has provided an example, a parable? This is, the example is a goodly word. Kalimatan tayyibah, a goodly word. An excellent formula, an excellent word, uh, which is like a goodly tree. So, a good word which is like a goodly tree whose root is firmly fixed and its branches reach the sky, giving its fruits at all times. By the leave of its Lord, Allah sets forth parables for mankind in order that they may remember, that they may take heed, that they may take a lesson. So, in summary, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is that in a number of places in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides examples. You'll see this in the Qur'an quite often. Daraballahu mathalan abdam mamluka, daraballahu mathalan rajulan. And then in this case, it's alam tara kayfa daraballahu mathalan kalima, kalimatan tayyiba. So Allah strikes a number of parables and he tells us that this is a parable. So this parable is like, the parable is actually of a goodly word. A word that you say to somebody, something you tell someone, a message that you give, a guidance that you convey, right? A message that you provide somebody. If it fulfills a number of characteristics, it becomes like a tree. What kind of a tree? A goodly tree. So a very healthy, uh, not a barren tree, not a diseased tree, but a very, very healthy, large tree whose roots become firmly entrenched in the ground. And its leaves and branches, its branches and leaves, they go up into the heavens. So this a tall, amazing, majestic tree. I mean, think of the redwoods. And in England, think of the tall elms that we have. Think of the, the London plane tree. Think of a uh, number of, I mean, you, you see these cherry blossoms and they generally tend to be a bit smaller. But the larger trees in England, they're, they're, they're for example, the oak tree. Or if you go to America, it's the redwoods. For example, likewise, there's the elms. There's uh, a number of other trees like that. Uh, there's the, 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 the large willows that you see. They're amazing, right? So it becomes like that, which continue to give its fruit time and time again. Regardless of what's going on, they keep the olive tree last for thousands of years, right? For example, and this is an example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides so that you may gain heed. So all of this is that say a good word that will grow. What this is encouraging is you can call this da'wah, you can call this invitation to Allah, invitation to goodness, invitation to positivity. Uh, Basically, this can also be a word that you say to somebody to comfort them, to calm them down, to make them feel good. Uh, They say that, قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ min If you can't give sadaqa, or even if you do give sadaqa and charity, and you follow that up with, you follow that up with uh, harm and reminders and trying to extract favors from the people that you give charity to. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that just saying a goodly word to somebody and forgiving somebody that's much better than that kind of sadaqa and charity that is followed up by harm to somebody. So good word is always a good thing in Islam. And we can take this as maybe a good word that you establish somewhere and thus people start doing something good. You give a talk somewhere, you 
talk to somebody privately and you diffuse a matter, you diffuse a situation. Let's just say that there's a couple that you know who are constantly bickering. There's a, there's a partnership of a business. There's brothers in a business. They're constantly at one another and they have some massive disagreements. So what you go and do is that with your words, you calm the situation down. You reconcile between them. You bring them close together again. Or you go and give da'wah and mashallah, you make people faithful. You draw them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You go out in tabligh, you go out in da'wah. You go and uh, assist somebody to embrace Islam, to, give the, to share, them, share with them uh, the, this beautiful way. Now what happens is that this will sprout. Now imagine, just think about this. Uh, the same thing is the case where if I teach somebody, if I teach my child how to read the Qur'an, now, once they know how to read the Quran and now for the rest of their life. So if I uh, helped my children to become Hafiz of the Quran now for the rest of their life, they're going to be reading Quran. They're going to be using the Quran. They're going to be inspired by the Quran. They're going to be benefiting from the Quran. And ultimately, they're going to get and ascend to paradise with the Quran. The Quran is one of the most beautiful words. So that's like a tree which will cons consistently afterwards its roots will grow. That's what happens to trees. Their roots grow. They become more firm. And it's very, very difficult to uproot a tree the older it is because their roots become well grounded and well established in the ground, right? In order to stabilize itself. And then its branches are up in the heavens. It's giving, it's giving fruit after fruit. And sometimes you don't need to do anything for it afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of trees which you have to look after in its growing stages. But after that, you don't need to look after them. They do their own part. And that's what's really interesting here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example of a goodly tree. Right? That's what's really interesting about this. So goodness is a prerequisite of any word that you say for it to have this uh, uh, be according to this parable. You need to, uh, along with that, um, you see, all of these things... Uh, for example, if you are intelligently convey something, if you um, articulate something in a very eloquent way, all of these things may be side points. The main thing, though, is that the content needs to be good and it needs to be pure and sincere. Then that becomes a goodly word. There are many people giving da'wah or there are many people with da'wah organizations. There are many people... Uh, who have uh, claimed throughout history, not just in the Islamic tradition, uh, who claim to uh, be big movers and shakers in, in many different aspects. But it's the sincerity that's really going to count in this, the goodness, right? That, should, uh, that is what should come about. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do you not see how Allah sets forth a parable, a goodly word? So the message should be good and Mere words are not an end to themselves. You see, word is just a carrier. It's just an articulation. You know, when I say something to you, I'm just conveying something to you at the end of the day. There needs to be something in there, right? There needs to be a lot more in there for it to be beneficial. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this beneficial. It's not just about linguistic competence, for example, on eloquence of the way you say something. That's assisting, that does help, but that's not the main point. You could be very, very eloquent and eventually people will see through you. Initially, they'll listen to you, they'll, they'll, they'll admire what you say, but eventually they'll realize that there's actually nothing, there's no content in there. So, the Quranic simile, it could have used so many different words, but it speaks about the tree, right? It could have spoken about... Pearls, gems, could have spoken about jewels, could have spoken about gold because people love gold. They could have said a good word is like gold because people value gold or silver. Could have spoken about it being like a flower in itself or just one of the fruits. Because I guess we would probably, if I said to you that, you know, there's a, there is a mango tree. Well, okay, it's a mango tree. But if I told you, here are some mangoes for you. Here's a watermelon for you, right? That's a lot more closer to home, right? So that could have been the similitude. But no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a good tree. Because tree, a tree has its own life. And I think that's what's really interesting here. When you say a good word, it's going to have its own life. It's going to have its own efficacy. It's going to, mashallah, affect somebody in the right way. So even after, after they've gone from you and you've said something to them, they're going to be ruminating that, uh, over those words. It, they're going to be thinking about it. 
especially if it came from heart to uh, and it came from from a from a sincere heart and then that will start having its effect subhanallah subhanallah this is what happens we plant the seeds and they take and they germinate especially those that are done with sincerity they germinate so always try to say good words to people always try to say comforting words for people you will probably notice that those people that who you re, you really can relate to are those people who say good words all the time even if it's a mundane situation even if it's just a normal casual remark they say good words and what that does is that that stays with you it, it entrenches itself in your heart and then after that the fruits of it come out right and the fruits is that when you go by that word when you act on that word that's what happens one of the biggest examples of this in history is the kalima la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah that is one of the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's da'wah started in makkah mukarramah that was a word who would have expected that this could have become entrenched in the whole world tuba lil ghuraba al islam bada ghariban islam started in an isolated way in a lonesome way right in solitude in aloneness in a few members with difficulty persecution against all odds against a larger community all banded together but slowly slowly this word mashallah it became like this tree that it took up its roots and then after that its branches have spread throughout the world that's why today mashallah we sit in england i mean one of the best example an amazing example of this actually if we look more recently is that the subcontinent the indian subcontinent when the british had occupied it from the 1700 through the east india company and then eventually they pretty much sculpted most of india and they they basically established themselves throughout india what they started doing afterwards and this is we're talking about the early 1800s especially during that time the late uh, 1700 uh, the 1800s early 1900s as well so you can say late 1800s i mean uh, ha- halfway through 1800s what they started doing was when it's when there was a resistance from the muslims the muslims put up a resistance and the hindus they put up a resistance against british rule so what they started doing was that they started to do this mass conversion programs this they tried to destroy the faith and this is what happens because if you can destroy somebody's faith and get them kind of onto your faith then they'll be they'll be they'll they'll kind of relate to you much more so huge amounts of missionaries came from the uk you know came from the uh, came from england and uh, scotland and other places and then they started to use various different ways of trying to convert people in islam to christianity and that's why today you have a a, a minority you know a sizable minority of christians down south in other places you know in india otherwise there were no christians in india before it was just muslims and and uh, and hindus and and maybe some buddhists but the the christians that's that's what happened it was a major issue so of course the uh, scholars they put up a defense and everything like that but who would have thought that from the very place that came to dominate that came to conquer that came to vanquish and that came to overwhelm uh, the communities of the subcontinent that today in those very very places you have mashallah i mean this is where we're sitting today right and this is where many of you are as well and there's people from other places where the call of da'wah mashallah there are probably more muslim seminaries producing scholars than there are for christian seminaries in this country at least effective ones uh, to that you know that, that that are there in full force mashallah what an amazing thing that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done now we need to continue to do this we need to continue to make an effort and defend ourselves and to remain strong because that's important that we remain strong this goodly word that starts in arabia right it has spread throughout the world then where there's persecution in the indian subcontinent you you find that we have this uh, mashallah you know in england in the very home of where the persecution had started in the subcontinent you mashallah there are uh, you know a sizable huge a growing sizable uh, community of uh, islam and of muslims and mashallah of the kalima la ilaha illallah this shows a number of uh, a, a number of uh, mashallah success stories I'll give you uh, another story. So during the Mongols after they had uh, destroyed uh, many of the communities and uh, Baghdad and all of these people uh, all of these different areas there was uh, one of the Mongol leaders his name was uh, Tughluq Timur Khan Tughluq Timur Khan he's one of the Mongol uh, leaders and uh, he uh, he he is between 1347 and he died in 1363 that's his reign essentially right now 
he was a prince at this time and he was uh, uh, stationed in a place called Kashgar. Right, Kashgar today, as many of you might know, is actually in the eastern uh, Turkestan province uh, in, in China, the, the Xinjiang region, right? The Kashgar is one of the, the, the big towns down there, right? That's one of the big cities of that area, uh, along with Urumqi and uh, another one. So they had devastated, uh, Baghdad had been devastated in 1258 already, and the Muslim Caliphate had been struck a major blow and uh, the Khalif had been killed by them as well. And it just felt like, I mean, if you look, if you read the histories of that time, you know, it is a very, very, very despondent uh, reading. And most of the historians are, are really, really, you know, pained uh, in, their, in their details. So what happens now is that you've got this one Mongol, uh, you know, a ruler, right? Or a, uh, you can say a prince. And uh, he is... Subhanallah, you know, he is out hunting one day in that Kashka region, right? And he's hunting for deer or lion or something like that. And um, he's got his hunting lands and nobody's supposed to venture into them. Now, what happens at that particular time is that there's a, a Persian uh, religious man, a Persian religious scholar, rather, whose name is Sheikh Jamaluddin, right? And he unwittingly trespasses into these lands into this game reserve and he is caught and he's brought in front of uh, Timur and uh, Tughluq Timur he's brought in front of him and the, the, he's very angry he's very angry because these guys were very angry right and he's saying to him that uh, soon as he sees him he knows that he's a Persian so he says he says to him that a dog is worth more than a Persian. Like, you guys are nothing. Because they, they'd been all overcome. And they'd been, uh, they'd been taken over by the Mongols. So he said, dogs are better than you. Now the Sheikh is like, what should I say? He says, yes, you're right. As long as, if we don't have true faith, then you're absolutely right. We would definitely be worse than dogs. Now to get that kind of a response, this Tughluq Timur, was, this prince was just totally taken aback. And... He says, what do you mean? So the Sheikh then sat before him and told him about the doctrines of Islam. And he gave it in such a beautiful way. And it was a goodly word that he gave him, right? In this beautiful, sincere way, right? At that time, I mean, he didn't try to use excuses to get out. He actually literally told him about Islam at that time. And, you know, these Mongols, they would just kill you, right? So he had no fear of that. He just told him exactly the way it was. And this affected him, melted him, it melted him, mashallah. So now what happens is that um, the prince, he says, look, I can't do anything right now, but I feel that this is really good. Wait until the time that I become the leader after my father, because his father was in uh, what, what was, the, was the ruler of the time. So he says, wait until he, uh, wait until I become the leader. And then after that, come back to me and then we'll, we'll do something. So, I mean, this is a story that's related by the Muslim biographers and also by Arnold, right, in his famous history. The same, similar kind of story is mentioned there. There's a few differences in there. But in one, it's a, in, uh, in another version, he actually says that the Sheikh said to him that if I die in a state of faith, then I am more worthy, right? Otherwise, the dog is more worthy than me. Right, so that's the response that he gave. Anyway, whatever happened is that the Sheikh was waiting for this Timur uh, to ascend the throne so that he could go and remind him of the promise. But he didn't and the Sheikh passed away. But before the Sheikh passed away, he called his son whose name was Sheikh Rashiduddin. And he said that, look, it's not been my honor to be able to get this prince to embrace Islam, although he's promised, right? Maybe this is destined for you. You need to watch out with him whenever you see him whenever you can get access to him, as soon as he becomes the ruler, the sovereign, then go and meet him and remind him of this incident. So now what happens is that uh, his son is waiting and eventually he finds out that he has ascended the throne and he's become the leader. Um, this is Tughluq Timur has become the leader. Now he can't get access to him. Now how do you get into that? I mean, he's a normal kind of person. How, did, how does he get uh, access to this, uh, this king's uh, court? So what he does is that he goes outside his palace close by and he sets up camp down there and he starts to stay there. But at every prayer time, what he does is that he starts to give adhan. 
Now, one of these occasions at Fajr time, Tughluq Taymur is inside his fort or his area, whatever it is, and his encampment. And he hears the adhan. He says, what is this noise? You know, who's disturbing us, basically? So um, they tell him that it's, uh, they, they, they bring Sheikh... Uh, they, they bring the sheikh down, Sheikh Rashid is deen uh, brings down, oh, it's this person, he's making this adhan, he's calling the prayer very boldly and so on. So at that time, mashallah, Sheikh Rashid deen now gets his access to the, to, to, the, uh, to the king and he says, do you recall once while you're hunting and there was a Persian man, right, that you had this conversation with about uh, who's better, whether it's a dog or not. And I'm here, I'm his son. I've come here to remind you of what you had told me to what, what you had told my father to remind you about. So mashallah, the, the, the ruler becomes Muslim. And as soon as he becomes Muslim, uh, he is now has to see if he can uh, get everybody else to follow suit. Now remember, you have your advisors, you have your army commanders and all of this. I mean, this is always happens. This is the same issue with Hiraqal. When he challenged Abu Sufyan, and Abu Sufyan uh, told him about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in in uh, Makkah Mukarrama, and uh, the Iman seems to have kind of found a place in Heraclius's heart, but then he went and asked some of his advisors, and they uh, in in disguise basically or in a veiled way that what do you guys think about this, and obviously they gave a very negative answer, and then he did not pursue it. Whereas in this case, what happens is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this word. It was a goodly word done by the right person in the right way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to bring about elevation for the Muslims again after they'd been destroyed or really, really, really weakened and debilitated and incapacitated by the Mongols through the Mongols themselves. So now what happens is this, this king, he goes to some of his closest people and he tells them in privacy that, you know, he trusted them. He says, look, I've embraced Islam. What do you think? And subhanAllah, this person he asked, one of his main courtiers, he says, you know, you just became Muslim today. I didn't want to tell you, but I'd or, I've already been a Muslim for a long time. But out of fear for you, I've, I've not been expressing it. Right. I've not openly declared it. And subhanAllah, like that, all of his family and his close people became Muslim. And that just changed the whole trajectory. Subhanallah. And that's when the Mongols, the Golden Horde and many of the others, they eventually turn to Islam. Subhanallah. That's why, that's why you have uh, them doing a number of good things afterwards. Otherwise, it was felt like Islam had become so weakened after their attacks. That's a goodly word. Mathalu kalimatin tayyiba. Right? That's a, a mathalu kalimatin tayyiba is like the goodly tree. Try to plant trees wherever you go. Plant the seeds and make it such that these seeds will germinate and eventually they will take up a life of their own. May Allah allow us to leave many legacies like that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this discourse to be a kalimatun tayyibah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us sincerity and focus. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our Ramadans. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of our organizations that are doing good work and allow them to be goodly words. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam, at least at their basic level, so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam, and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind. You can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.